Uh, these lectures have been put together by the Public Engagement Director to hear from all the leaders of all the political parties um, in advance of the Assembly election in May. So it is a lecture. Uh, you will hear from the party leader, who this evening is Peter Tobin from Into, and you will get the opportunities to put questions to him. I would warn you all in advance that we are broadcasting live, and this event is also recorded and will go out online afterwards so if you're asking questions and you do not want to be identified, you need to tell us. Um, I would also highlight, like every good lecturer would, that this is a area of respect. Um, you may have opposing views or you may have similar views to our speaker this evening, but everything's to be conducted uh, with a challenge, but also with a level of respect for all the political viewpoints that we allow to have a platform here at Queen's. So I'm delighted to welcome this evening's speaker, uh, Peter Tobin, TD, who is the founder and leader of N2. Peter has been a TD for the Meath West constituency since 2011, having been elected as a member of Sinn Féin. He previously served as the chair of the Committee on Arts, Heritage, Regional, Rural and Giltock Affairs from 2016 to 2018. He left Sinn Féin to found N2 in January to 2019, um, having... Uh, broke the party whip on the vote for the regulation of termination of pregnancy bill in 2018. Peter retained his seat in Meath West with 7,322 first preference votes or 17.6% of the uh, first chair in that constituency and was elected um, as in the second of the constituency's three seats. He is married with four children has a degree in economic and politics from UCD, will not hold that against him, and he is a business consultant by trade. So, without any further ado, I'm delighted to welcome this evening's leader for the lecture, Petter Tobin. Petter. Gerda Mila Magruf, as an desh ve an show anu, tomay anabuich gwil kadagom lauert livsha in ulskol na bon riena anu agus kame buichus agawol the Ryan Freshen as an quira. Uh, on show a new freshen. So I'd like to thank everybody for coming along here today, and I really appreciate and am honoured to have the opportunity to speak in Queen's University in Belfast. And I'd like to thank Ryan uh, especially uh, for facilitating that as well. And I think it's really important that uh, AIM2 is the newest political party uh, that's contesting these elections. Indeed, we've never contested uh, a, a Stormont or an Assembly election. This will be our first. And it's really important that we have an opportunity to engage with people with regards to the platform that we have uh, in terms of what we will bring to the table uh, in the future uh, in the, in the Stormont uh, area. So first of all, I would like to just say that I'm a, an Irish nationalist. I'm an Irish Republican. Uh, I've been an activist for about 30 years at this stage. Um, and I will say that in those years, especially within the last 24 years, I haven't seen the state of the democratic process in the north of Ireland in such a chaotic state. It is an absolute credible situation that right now in the north of Ireland, there is such political chaos. And that political chaos is going hand in hand with economic and social chaos as well. So there's 44,000 people in this state that are currently on waiting lists for housing. There's 260,000 people who are on waiting lists for hospital appointments for more than one year. There's about 300,000 people who are in poverty currently in this state. And men and women and children are suffering from a massive cost of living crisis. Indeed, there are children going to sleep tonight in this state hungry for the absence of food in their tummies. And the fact that that's happening, while at the same time that we have a government and a, an executive that is suspended is absolutely incredible. And I would ask you, can you think of one other democratic state on the planet that would allow for that confluence of crisis to occur while at the same time put their own government into abeyance? It wouldn't happen anywhere else and it wouldn't actually be tolerated anywhere else at all. And the Good Friday Agreement under which underpins all of this is also in big trouble. Like most people, I supported the Good Friday Agreement, and it changed the chapter uh, of history uh, in the north of Ireland for sure. But the Good Friday Agreement has been significantly gutted 
over the last number of years. So the executive obviously is a, a, a significant part of the Good Friday Agreement. It's not functioning at the moment. But for most nationalists, the North-South Ministerial Council was also a really important reason to support the Good Friday Agreement. And it's in abeyance. It's gutted also as well. And we have this really strange situation that the DUP have now stated that even after the people of the North of Ireland have their say in the elections, they're still not going to go into government unless they get their way. Again, that would be tolerated in no other democratic state on the planet. The DUP currently, their support accounts for about 8% of the vote of the whole island of Ireland. And obviously in the last Westminster election, they got about 30% of the vote. But they are a minority. And no minority should be able to pull down any democratic institution anywhere. It's absolutely wrong. Um, so we in AIM2, first of all, uh, are the only political party who are calling for change in this area. You would imagine, under this circumstance, that all of the political parties on the airwaves will be tripping over each other in calling for reform. Is there any other political party currently facing the crisis that we're in, actually calling for reform of the institutions? It's an incredible situation that it took aim to to actually call for the Taoiseach and the British ambassador to attend the Good Friday Agreement Committee in Leinster House. It took us to force those two individuals to come to us. Now, it remains to be seen whether the British ambassador will do good by the invitation that his, he's received, but the Taoiseach at least will come. And remember that both the British government and the Irish government are co-guarantors to the Good Friday Agreement. They're, no, they're not co-guaranteeing anything at the moment. They're tolerating what's happening uh, in this state. And it's also an incredible situation. I note, obviously, that Simon Coveney was in Belfast in, in, uh, in the last number of days, and he had to bring his uh, address to an end. And I just th think it's absolutely incredible that on the streets, the UDA and the UVF are still active. And yet British government's officials are still meeting them, and the DUP are calling them central stakeholders uh, in society. So it, it is crystal clear, in my view, that the political system itself in this state is truly broken. And it is really important, in my view, that we have a, 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 a view amongst all the political parties that there is, it, it is time for reform of those institutions. For if those institutions are not reformed, you can bet your bottom dollar that we're going to see crisis after crisis into the future again. It is a recipe for instability and dysfunction to allow for one political party to bring down the house in terms of the political institutions of a state. Another uh, view of, our, of AIM2 is that we are of the view that MLAs who won't do their job shouldn't get paid. MLAs who are members of political parties that crash the institutions shouldn't get paid. If there was a nurse, a doctor, a teacher, or a postman who called in and said, listen, I'm not doing my job anymore, how long do you think they would get paid for? It simply wouldn't be tolerated. And why is it tolerated of the political class in the north of Ireland? Uh, we are looking for reforms of the institutions to make sure no one political party can pull down the institutions again. It has to end. We do believe there has to be a cross-community um, uh, guarantee that no community will suffer the majoritarianism of the other community to reduce the rights that they have. And, but that does not allow for one political party uh, to run away and say that the institutions cannot function again. Um, one of the other major problems that's happening under the current institutions, and people probably don't realize this, is a lack of an opposition. I just think it's incredible that um, over the last 10 years, Sinn Féin, the SDLP, the UUP, the DUP and the Alliance have taken 800 beds out of the health service in the north of Ireland. 800 beds. Now that has led in large part to the fact that we have uh, 260,000 people in hospital waiting lists, but it also put the North in serious trouble in the combat of the COVID crisis. Serious trouble. You would imagine that the political parties would be looking to make political hay out of that issue, but there's hardly a dicky bird amongst the political parties in that issue. Why? Because they're all members of the same executive that actually cut those hospital beds back. 
The fact that there isn't an opposition challenging, pushing, testing the government here in the north of Ireland is a major difficulty and a major problem. None of us as human beings will do our job to the best level we can unless we're being challenged on a daily basis on how it's done. And the establishment and Stormont executive must be challenged on every single decision that, they're made, that they make. And that can only happen on the basis of a functioning opposition. Another issue that I, I want to mention here is that we see the, the Sinn Féin and the SELP especially using the, uh, the political slogan in this election, vote for us because it's a vote for change. Now, I don't know if they understand the irony that a vote for change can be a vote for a party that's in power for the last 25 years. How can you do that? A vote for either of those two political parties is a vote for the status quo. It is a, is a vote for the situation as it stands now, unfortunately. I believe that those two political parties in many ways have become the Fianna Fáil and the Fianna Gael uh, of the North, in that they have become quite comfortable in the institutions that they're in and the establishments that they're in, and they don't have the fights and the hunger to change those institutions. Another um, crisis that's happened during this dysfunction at Stormont is the introduction of abortion on demand in the north of Ireland. I believe it's a, a really incredible issue. The north has gone from being one of the safest places in the world to be a child in the womb to now one of the most dangerous places uh, on the planet uh, to be a child uh, in the womb. In the last three years, there has been 23,000 abortions north and south. That's the equivalent of 900 classrooms of children who no longer exist in our state as a result of the laws that have been introduced. 900 classrooms of children are no longer with us because of those laws. Now, how it's happened is incredible because Sinn Féin would see itself as a Republican political party. But for 200 years, Republicans have gone to London and told London, you have no right to legislate for any part of Ireland. And yet, Michelle O'Neill and Mary Lou Macdonald went to London, demanded and lobbied that Westminster would force this law onto the north of Ireland against, according to the opinion polls, the will of the people. Most opinion polls indicated that most people wanted this issue decided by, by the executive, by, the, by Stormont, by the directly elected people here in the north of Ireland. And yet that issue which was devolved, that power that was devolved, was circumvented. So in many ways Sinn Féin binned what was a very dearly held principle of Irish republicanism going back for 200 years. And in relation to the SDLP, the SDLP leadership have done an incredible vault face on this particular issue and actually have turned their backs on their grassroots members and their, the majority of their electors in relation to this issue over the last while as well. The proclamation of the Republic, which was read out on the steps of the GPO in 1916, stated very, very clearly that we must cherish all of the children of the nation equally. That is our key objective as a political movement, as a political party. And neither of the other two nationalist parties currently in the north of Ireland aspires, aspire to that objective anymore. And it's heartbreaking to see. Um, in the last uh, two weeks, we've seen another really strange issue. Both of those two political parties marched 50 years ago for the protection of the civil rights to protest peacefully and respectfully. 50 years later, both of those political parties banned the right to this, the civil right to march or protest peacefully and respectfully. It's very, very much an Orwellian animal farm situation where the clothes are the same, the brands and the names are the same, but the political objectives are going in the opposite directions. Um, there's a, an issue that I wanted to, to mention here as well is that these all these issues that I've mentioned here, the, the, the socioeconomic issues and this particular social issue, are tied together. And, and people may not realize this, but one of the pieces of evidence that we heard in the 8th Committee uh, in Leinster House during the, the referendum uh, on the 8th was that 85% of abortions that happen are for socioeconomic reasons. And some people call them austerity abortions. There are situations where mothers feel that they don't have the economic choice to be able to bring their child to term or to raise their child to their full potential. And indeed, I'm working with, with a mother at the moment whose due date is the same date as her eviction. 
And the economic realities that exist for so many people as a result of a dysfunctional Stormont are actually forcing many women to feel that they have no choice. So it is a key objective of Ain2 to make sure that all mothers, north and south, have the economic confidence to be able to raise their child to their full potential. Every support that's necessary is given to them. Um, another issue that I wanted to speak about here is um, the issue of the, um, the issue of, let's say, the unionist community in the north of Ireland. Um, many people from a unionist community have contacted AIN2 and have said to us that they cannot see themselves ever agreeing to Sinn Féin's objectives for Irish unity. But they, they have said to us that they would like to talk to us about our vision for Irish unity. And indeed, many people of the Protestant faith have joined AIN2, and they are central and welcome and valued members uh, of our organization. And it has to be said that while there's much that we differ over in relation to unionism, there's actually a lot of common ground as well uh, with regards to nationalists and unionists uh, in the north of Ireland. And I also know that many people from a unionist perspective are looking to give AIN2 a preference in relation to the elections that are coming up. They see that the, the values that we share are a reason why they can actually cross their community in relation to giving a preference uh, in the election. And I think that's very, very important. Another issue that we hear from both communities is the issue of the education system. Now remember, AIM2 is a pluralist, republican political party. We believe in the Ireland of Wolf Tone. And the Ireland of Wolf Tone is an Ireland where Catholic, Protestant and dissenter can be who they are to the full extent in the public space and have no fear from the state whatsoever. And yet we have a situation happening in the education system that's changing that pluralism. So as you, as you know, obviously we support parents' rights uh, with regards to choosing the school that they want their kids to go to. And of course, the pupils themselves in choosing the, the schools that they want their children to go to. And we believe that integrated education, Catholic education, and controlled education is good education. All of them provide fabulous education and appeal to different values systems that people may have. And it's really important that we ensure that parents have the right to seek whatever education system suits their child. But we had a bill that went through Stormont very, very recently. And that bill said that some education is more equal than others. That if there is an issue with regards to funding, that some education should actually achieve that funding over other education systems. And that, in practical terms, mean that your local school down the road, if there's a funding um, uh, request made and they're in competition with another school, they could actually, by law, now be discriminated against. We fought for so many years for parity of esteem. And now we don't have that parity. We're actually legislating parity out of the system. It's an incredible situation. And both of the nationalist parties in uh, the Assembly are doing this work themselves. And I'll tell you, all of us know that there are hundreds of thousands of nationalists and Republicans living in the north of Ireland who simply don't have those views. Where is their voice? Who's speaking for them? Even if you don't agree with anything that I've said over the last while, is it healthy, is it healthy in a democratic situation that those voices are not heard, that they don't have a democratic outlet uh, in Stormont anymore? It's not healthy and it's wrong and it has to change. And AIM2 is giving those voters right across the north of Ireland an opportunity to have their voices back in the centre, the marketplace of democracy uh, here in the north as well. Um, the issue of, of Irish unity is obviously very, very important um, to uh, AIM2. It's one of our three pillars as a political party. And it just struck me that the unionist community over the last while have been badly served, I believe, by their leadership. I think that the DUP's activities over the last number of years have been an example of political self-harm. It's incredible that the decisions that the DUP have made, and I'm talking about Brexit, I'm talking about the May deal, I'm talking about backing Boris, and now seeking the protocol. So the North is in a sweet spot economically, and of course, unfortunately, the DUP want to change that situation for, for themselves. The DUP have said that for the protocol to be able to be, uh, to be implemented, it must have a unionist majority. 
But those days are over. The Good Friday Agreement was supposed to say that the constitutional arrangements and the directions of the north of Ireland must have a majority amongst everybody within society. It can't be just one community that has to have the majority within it. And what the DUP are missing is that for the union between the north of Ireland and Britain to work, nationalists must feel that it's functional, it's normal, and that it will provide for nationalists. Now, the DUP are going out of their way to prove that it's not functional, that it's not normal, and it won't provide for nationalists as well. The fact that the executive is not working is proof of that. The fact that the North-South Ministerial Council is not working is also proof in relation to that. Um, and I think that they're ignoring the fact that actually the majority of people voted to remain within the EU. So unless the DUP starts to understand and give respect to the majority view in the north of Ireland, unless they can prove that there's a function, that it will work for people, they're actually eroding the union as we speak. And the truth, I think that over the last four years, the DUP have probably done more for Irish reunification than Sinn Féin has done over the last 40 years um, in, in this state. Unfortunately, the DUP, I believe as well, they have their eyes in the re rear view mirror. They're focused on what's happening in relation to more hardline elements uh, of uni unionism. And they're allowing that to dictate the direction that they go in. Um, our view is that the only way to respond to that is a practical step towards unity. Practical unity is what we're about as a political party. And we believe that economics of scale, uh, efficiencies of public services, increased market sizes, uh, more representation in the EU, that will actually make the economies north and south stronger. Hubner in the British Columbia University carried out a, a study into the size of, of the GDP of both sides of the island under reunification. And he showed through that research that there's actually a significant financial dividend to the development of Ireland's north and south. And it's incredible if you look at it. Belfast was the biggest city uh, on the island of Ireland at partition. The richest three counties that existed on the island of Ireland were the three counties around Belfast. The level of production, the level of income was far higher north and south. And in the intervening years, that has completely flipped. And what's the difference in relation to that? I believe the key difference in relation to why the South is an economic powerhouse with all its failings and all its problems at the moment, and why the debate around unity here is about dependency on London's uh, subvention, the key difference is self-determination. Because when we can determine our own futures, we have a better chance of making a better decision for ourselves. If decisions are made in London, Brussels or Berlin, they won't be as good a decision as the decisions that the people here in this state will make for, uh, for ourselves as well. Uh, in relation to, I was the first TD that carried out a, 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 a research and a plan for the All-Ireland Economy in the Oireachtas, in the Dáil, since partition. No other political party, no other politician had undertaken a, a study in the Oireachtas in relation to that up until that uh, period of time. Um, what we've done as well in AIM2 is we've uh, launched a bill, and that bill will give elected representatives in the North, MPs in the North, the rights to speak in the Dáil. There's no constitutional prohibition on it. It would discommode nobody, but under our bill, an MP uh, for Antrim or for any other part of, of, of the North would be able to sit in the Dáil, represent the people in the North of Ireland to ask questions, etc. Now, we want to get to that sunny day where they'll also be able to vote, but we're going to have difficulties in relation to that and the other political parties. But there's a chance of our bill getting through. We also uh, have set up a campaign uh, in the Oireachtas, which would allow for uh, Northern MPs to sit on committees in the North and to be able to make sure that they can give their inputs and their views and their experience into those particular committees. Because what's happening is that both sides of the island are still functioning with the backs to each other. With regards to spatial planning, economic development, uh, et cetera, both parts of the island are operating uh, not in tandem, but against each other in many ways. Um, in relation to the, uh, the, the Good Friday Agreements Committee, we've also used that very, very uh, clearly to uh, 
put a, a request to the Chief Constable of the PSNI to attend the Good Friday Agreements Committee uh, in, in the Dáil. And the purpose of that is in relation to legacy issues and the fact that the uh, Chief Constable and the PSNI haven't brought convictions in many circumstances, circumstances that the Chief Ombudsman or the Police Ombudsman uh, in the North of Ireland have clearly outlined, uh, determined that there should be prosecutions. And we have asked that um, the Chief Constable come to answer questions in relation to that as well. And, you know, this, like, there's a big debate on the cost of living at the moment, and rightly so. But it's only AIM2 that's looking for the devolution of powers in terms of VAT and uh, excise to Belfast at the moment. Because a big chunk of your, uh, your, your gallon or your litre of petrol or diesel or home heating oil is actually excise and VAT. And one of the levers to alleviate the stresses on families will be to reduce that. But we can't, of course, reduce that in this state because the powers remained in London. If they were devolved to this state, we would be able to do that. Now, I've been speaking to even you know, so-called nationalist politicians in relation to that. And then they said, well, they do that, they'll, they'll reduce the funding that we get uh, as a state overall. If the, the level of VAT and excise reduce, well, then we'll get less money to be able to function here. But we want to grow this economy. If there's two ambitions, when, when I have a debate around the subvention uh, and uh, unity, I'm just really taken by the fact that one of the arguments is that if we go down the route of unity, we will lose the subvention from London. That's the politics of dependency. Imagine building your political objective around let's remain dependent on a place. We need, as a state, to have the politics of ambition. We need to be actually building a situation where we're creating a surplus every year through the economic development and activity that exists in this part of the country. And that economic surplus then is, is used to raise the standards of living of those who most need it. That's the politics of ambition. So when a person tells me, oh, you can't devolve a fiscal tool from London because it'll disrupt our subvention, they're speaking about the politics of dependency. And the politics of dependency has not served the north of Ireland well over the last 100 years. Um, the system is, is broken. And I'm often asked by, peop by people, how do we change what's happening in the north of Ireland? And we do need change. I think everybody realizes that. We need change with regards to the economy. We need to make sure that there's more north-south integration, that Intertrade Ireland has further investment, that you know, Invest NI and the IDA and Enterprise Ireland in the offices that are in, uh, uh, around internationally, that they're sharing the same spaces, the same money, that that money goes further and does better work for us. That we have three tourism organizations on the island of Ireland at the moment. Three is incredible. We need to start integrating and start making savings on the duplication that exists. Um, but people are, 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 are always asking me, how do we create change? And the way to create change is to turn up. And I mean that because the political system that exists in the north of Ireland currently depends upon people saying, I'm too busy to get involved. I have too much going on in my life to, to get politically active. It depends on that. It needs people to say, I can't do it right now. It needs a situation where elections not, are, are not about the people on, on housing waiting lists, or hospital waiting lists, or suffering from the cost of living, or suffering with regards to austerity abor abortion. Elections shouldn't be about that, according to the establishment. They should be about Sinn Féin versus the DUP. Elections should be about who do we keep out of seats. Now, as long as we have elections in that negative context, in that negative framework, we're going to have a negative result on the other end of it. And we're going to have dysfunction into the future. As long as it's orange versus green, and people leave their core values at home, or leave their economic values at home, well then nothing will ever change in those economic values or core values. AIM2 is a brand new political party. We're three years old. We're a toddler in real terms. But we've managed to pull together 50,000 votes in the last elections, north and south. We have over 1,000 members. We have fantastic candidates. Uh, contesting this election in the north of Ireland. We have 10 uh, fantastic candidates, and I can see many of them here in the audience today. And those candidates have, for the first time, a real opportunity of upsetting the establishment 
apple cart. But they will only do that, in my view, if people say that they're going to be part of that change as well. And that means getting active. It means taking responsibility for this country. It means not leaving it to the political establishment to run the show anymore. And it means getting out there and voting on the bread and butter issues, the right to life issues, the pluralism issues, and the education issues as well. And I would encourage people to use their vote wisely, use their activism wisely, use the next four or five weeks wisely, and let's make sure we take seats in this election. Gurmila Mahogav Galer. Okay, we, we had a wee bit of an issue with the broadcast, but we'll be putting it out later on, uh, recorded. So uh, we're getting questions in now, so people are seeing us online, but at the start we had a wee bit of a technical hitch, but don't worry, we'll make sure that the full lecture is put out online. Now, what we do at this section of the lecture is give you and the audience and you at home the opportunity to ask questions towards the leader. So those in the audience, percolate in your head some questions now if you don't have them already. I'm going to throw the ball in and start by asking Petter really around some of the issues in the speech. You were very clear to try and define your party against Sinn Féin and the SDLP because obviously you're aiming for the Catholic Nationalist Republican voter. Now, the criticism that may be levelled at into is that you're really just a one-trick pony that essentially it's about abortion. And really what I think you would need to maybe do tonight in terms of the, the speech that you give is follow on from that and talk wider about what would, what would an 18 year old who is a Republican or a nationalist who's maybe voting for the first time say when they go to the ballot box and they've got a choice between the SDLP, Sinn Féin and yourselves, give us your pitch as what defines your party versus the other two. Okay, well, I would say, um, obviously, we're clearly a very different political party. And actually, our growth has come from people coming from a lot of different political backgrounds together. People with no political backgrounds and people from Fianna Fáil, the SDLP, uh, and other political parties joining us as well. Um, I will say there's a new authoritarianism creeping in to the likes of Sinn Féin and the SDLP, in, in my view. Um, we would be very much a, a, a party where we believe in the freedom of speech, we believe in, let's say, the freedom to, of the right to protest. Uh, we believe that people should be able to articulate their views uh, fully and respectfully without fear or favour, and that the competition of ideas are actually the healthiest part of a functioning democracy. And that if you get into a democracy where people don't feel the ability to be able to engage on, on economic or social issues, you water down that ability for ideas to compete. And if you do that, well, then you're going to have worse outcomes in the end of the day as well. In relation to, let's say, in, in how the structures uh, open, like, we would be a political party that believes that people who work hard should have the rights to earn decent living, that there has to be a spark in the economy, and that if you work hard, that if you invest, if you spend time in education, um, if you take risks, there needs to be an economic benefit to do that. And if you don't have that economic benefit, well, you're not actually going to see wealth, wealth to uh, be generated. Um, so, but we also believe that there needs to be a safety net under people in terms of housing and healthcare and education. So I think that would pitch us at a different place um, than Sinn Féin. In relation to the north of Ireland, one of the, the big issues that I'm, I'm hearing at the door at the moment is people are saying funding that's coming through into the north, it seems to be split amongst, let's say, nearly political lines. That the remnants of the uh, the, 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 the factions before the Good Friday Agreement are now the people who have funds coming through them and are distributing those funds into their own communities. And I met with a loyalist woman from East Belfast you know, who had a, a relation of hers murdered uh, by a loyalist uh, paramilitary. And she couldn't believe that that loyalist paramilitary, or at least the people who were involved with them, are the people who are actually distributing funds for community issues. So if we would believe in future that all funding that goes into the community should be tendered for openly by different organizations who can do the job better. And that the idea that they would be distributed amongst these lines um, is, is damaging to society and actually leaves a lot of the, uh, the, 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 the cracks, if you like, uh, still in place. 
Um, we would be, uh, we're an environmentalist political party, very strongly as well. We believe that um, nobody has a right to pollute, that global warming is, is a real issue, that we have to focus on that. Um, one of the issues that we're, we're pushing on at the moment is to make sure that there is more access to microgeneration. The farming community, for example, across the north of Ireland um, are suffering in, in a big way because of the fall in prices of um, farming commodities, beef, uh, wheat, uh, milk, uh, etc. Although the, the, the current inflation has, has maybe helped them somewhat. Uh, but we believe there needs to be more supports given to farmers in terms of allowing them to generate electricity and get a, a better feed in tariff in relation to that as well. We've also spoken to farming groups uh, in the north of Ireland about making sure that there is a, is a, um, a proper price paid for those uh, items. Uh, we believe that we bring an economic expertise that maybe Sinn Féin and the SEL, SELP don't have as well. The market structure in the north of Ireland currently uh, means that there are um, you know, you have farmers, you have factories, and you have supermarkets. And that supply chain is very profitable, but most of the profit is actually landing in the supermarkets or the factories. And the price has been pushed down at the farming level over and over again until the farmer is, is working for nearly a subsistence level. And we believe that there needs to be uh, more competition in the supply chain to ensure that the profits are distributed uh, far more fairly uh, at all levels of that. Because in the end of the day, if we don't do that, we're not going to have family farms that are functional and profitable uh, in existence uh, in the north or anywhere else for that matter. Okay. And you answered my second question. It was on the green economy that came in from a member of the audience uh, that's tuning in. Now, we'll move to the floor. And if there is anyone that would like to ask a question, please put up your hand. And we'd like someone from the floor. It's not like an audience to be quiet. Yep, this gentleman at the front here. <coughs> Just wait for the microphone, sir, because we're going to... Uh, he, the audience online need to hear you. You were saying that um, we shouldn't be too, uh, we shouldn't set ourselves up in the future to be dependent on subvention from Britain, and we should we shouldn't pay too much attention to these people who are trying to hold us back by saying, well, well if we go down the road that you're saying, you know, how are we going to manage uh, overnight to continue on without this subvention? Have you factored in in some way or other a transition? that will take us from one stage to the other? Yep, well, it, um, a, a big chunk of the subvention that's paid uh, from the north of Ireland currently is uh, on issues that don't affect uh, or benefit the north of Ireland. So things like the British Army, um, the, the British services uh, abroad, etc. Another element are pensions, um, and we believe that the British would have a responsibility uh, to pay pensions to people in the north of Ireland uh, after unity also. And the reason being is because the reason a person gets paid a pension is because they spent all their life working and they paid social security or national security to achieve that pension. Um, the British would still remain uh, responsible for that social contract in the events uh, of Irish unity. And indeed in, in Brexit with the separation of Britain uh, and the European Union, the issues of pensions remained uh, in place even after Britain uh, has left uh, the European Union. Um, there is a, for, for us, uh, one of the, the, the major elements to resolve the disparity between the level of money that the North uh, currently needs to run and the level of income it gets uh, is the basis of the fact that the economy is not working uh, to the level it should. And you know, a, a number of years ago, there was a big debate about uh, corporation taxes being devolved uh, to the North of Ireland. Um, and I just can't, I can't believe that the Stormont hasn't actually uh, kick-started that process. And we want to see an equalisation of corporation taxes north and south. And that would, without a shadow of a doubt, <clears throat> make the north a far more attractive place for foreign direct investment uh, in the future. Um, we, we want to see a situation where the level of investments to invest in I is radically increased uh, as well. Um, one of the big problems that's happening in, in the north is a lack of proper spatial investment. So thankfully, there's 
decent levels of investment coming into the Belfast uh, region, but there isn't the same level of investment that's going outside west of the ban in economic or business uh, terms. The west of the ban is suffering significantly. And I, I'm thinking of Derry especially. It, it just shocks me uh, that that level of investment hasn't gone into the likes of Derry, the likes of Tyrone, uh, the likes of Fermanagh either. And, and it's very, very simple. If, if you invest in good infrastructure, good telecommunication ICT infra infrastructure, good transport infrastructure, and good education infrastructure. They're the three most important inputs to most businesses, and businesses will locate where that infrastructure is. But if you don't invest there, much of the north is, going, is not going to be seen as a place for either foreign direct investment or indeed a location where indigenous business uh, can, can start up uh, as well. Um, just another issue that's not taken into consideration in the, um, the subvention is corporation taxes. So corporation taxes are paid separately to London uh, and not to uh, the, the, the north of Ireland. Um, and so we don't really know exactly the corporation taxes that are paid by businesses uh, in the north of Ireland and that has to change. And there's no doubt in my mind that there will be a transition period some say it's, it's 10 billion. We don't believe it's next near or near 10 billion. We believe it, it's closer to 2 billion euros. But I, with help from the, the southern states, with Britain continuing its responsibilities for a period of time, and the European Union as a guarantor of a peaceful transition uh, and the growth of the economy in the north, I believe that that can be flipped and the north can have a surplus uh, and that we can... Listen, the people of... Uh, Letterkenny are not cleverer than the people of Derry. The people of Dundalk are not more industrious than the people of Newry. You know, the people of Monaghan are not, you know, harder working um, than the people of Dungannon. The, 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 the core uh, building blocks of a functional, uh, uh, a successful economy exist. The key element that's missing is self-determination. And, you know, it's not just the North that's suffering from that. London is the, the, a, this, and, and the home counties is where most of the economic growth happens in Britain and the north of Ireland. Even Scotland has realised that its economic path is better uh, separate, separated from London. The north of England and Wales have suffered economically uh, as a result. Remember, the south was known for beer and biscuits at the time of partition. And that was because it was treated as an economic backwater by London. But when self-determination, where people have an opportunity to be able to make decisions for themselves economically, they have a much better opportunity to building an economy that suits them. Okay, question from online. Um, you talked about the Stormont stalemate and talked about how E2 would change that. Are you suggesting a renegotiation in terms of the Strand 1 structures, uh, change from power share and majority rule, or something different? Yeah, we, we, we are, we're talking about reforming the political institutions of the north of Ireland. Um, so I think the key objective from the outset is that we have functional uh, political institutions. We must come to terms with the fact that we don't have functional political institutions and that there are major economic problems and societal problems that are coming from that. So we set out the view, well, how do we create functional economic ins or political institutions and make sure that there's some level of cross-community um, protections so that neither community feels that they will suffer from the majoritarianism of the other community. I believe that we can uh, have negotiations between the British and Irish government uh, in how that can be achieved. Now, uh, people will say, well, the DUP are not going to agree to any shift in direction from the current status quo. But I would say the DUP didn't agree to the Good Friday Agreement in the first place anyways. And that the, the decision was made to proceed on the basis of that. Remember, 85% of the population of this island of ours voted for the Good Friday Agreement that's now being gutted by a political party that represents 8% of the voters on the island of Ireland. That is just intolerable and it has to change. So we've talked about the Strand 1 structures and reform and you've mentioned quite a bit the North South Ministerial Council, the Strand 2 institutions. Give me your view on their effectiveness and where you see them going forward. Well first of all the, the, the North South Ministerial Council is not functioning and actually a court, recent court case says it was uh, a breaking the law but because it was in the political sphere that they couldn't uh, affect change in that. Well actually the, the law needs to be changed to, to make sure it happens, to enforce it uh, happening. Um, and you know we need to have a, a situation that if ministers don't turn up 
for their job that another minister will fill the space. If, if a minister does not uh, select a person to do their job or becomes completely obstructionist, uh, that somebody else is, is put in, in, into their place. Uh, in relation to the, uh, the executive and how the executive would function, um, right now obviously it's, it's the DUP have um, and any political party on the executive that wants to uh, pull it down uh, has the, the ability to do that. And we, be, we believe that there needs to be a, a reduction in the proportion uh, nece uh, necessary um, to keep the executive functioning, if you understand. So maybe a, a figure around 65% of uh, the, the representatives in Stormont, if, if decided to create an executive, can proceed or if they decide to continue with an executive, can proceed uh, in that situation. Um, you know, we, we wouldn't be prescriptive. Ideally, we would like to have it as all of the different political parties would come in and agree to negotiate. But if it doesn't happen, um, the Irish and British uh, 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 governments have a responsibility uh, to, to do that. Um, because what is the, the, the alternative? The alternative is political instability and economic stagnation uh, for generations. Um, and, and, and I'll be honest here, one of the reasons why we're in the diffi difficulties we're in at the moment is because of the British government's attitudes uh, to the Good Friday Agreement and to the whole pro uh, process. Unfortunately, they have taken a, uh, they've left multilateralism uh, behind and they've taken a, a, most of their political steps are now unilateral uh, and they're not even discussing or talking to the southern government on, on many issues. We see the, the British government literally fighting with uh, southern ministers now on Twitter. Uh, it's an absolutely incredible situation. Um, but we have a, a big lever and that lever lives in the White House. And you know, if there's, there's not a lot that the southern state can do often with regards when it comes to the British government. But we do have America on our side in these terms. Um, and I think that I do believe that the Irish government unfortunately have warm hands. I think they sit on their hands for a long period of time and they're not active or engaged enough in, in these areas. Uh, and I think that the Irish government needs to take a far more uh, constructive, engaged role, especially with the United States, to start to push the British into actually fulfilling their responsibilities. OK, we'll take another question from the floor. Yeah, gentleman here. Um, thank you, Mr. Tobin. Um, I was wondering uh, what your views are, which you've just mentioned in there, about the disengagement that seems to be taking place between the London, um, the London Great and the Good with regard to their further involvement here in this part of Ireland. Uh, because um, I'm thinking that we're coming towards this time where there's 50-50% between the, the, the unionist population and the non-unionist population. And, um, and your outreach to the unionist population was quite remarkable in that um, I think from talking to uh, unionists within my community, we have the same traditional views on many, many, many parts of life. Uh, it cuts across all the British-Irish uh, differences because we come from a similar background, whether it be rural or urban. Now, admittedly, here in parts of Belfast, many Catholics do not meet Protestants, but in many, many other parts of the six counties, we do meet up, and we have more in common than we have against us. So I'm thinking, in terms of what you were talking about earlier on, about the outreach towards the unionist population, the disengagement of the British government in terms of the amount of money that they're putting into this part of the world, all, albeit a very dependency-related, uh, amount of money they're given to us, that the writing's on the wall for the um, future of the Union. And uh, I was wondering whether the Unionist population can be taken on board and look at the positives of the reunification of our country in light of what you just said earlier on. I think there's two things. So that's, it, it's important. I think, first of all, there's a lot of middle, what I would call small U Unionists, who are coming to the view um, that because of the actions of the DUP, that their situation would be better off uh, in relation to an agreed or, or united Ireland. Um, and remember, the name Ain Tu means unity or it means agreement. They're the two meanings uh, for uh, our political party. And that's the reason why we selected Ain Tu as a name, because we want an agreed united Ireland. Um, and I also think as well that you know, Sinn Féin and the SDLP have been missing you know, a, a very simple uh, action over the last number of years. I believe that the border is like a wall with a thousand blocks. I think each one of those blocks represents a, an issue in someone's life. 
a practical, real bread and butter human issue in their lives. And I'll give you an example. So, in, you know, we have different health services north and south. We have people who have particular illnesses or conditions in the north that can't be treated um, in the south and vice versa. And we have, you know, universities are, are not, you know, while there is cooperation, and we welcome that cooperation, there's far more scope for university cooperation north and south. And education, you know, there's, there's different uh, curriculum, there's different materials being produced. Um, in environmental terms, you know, it is incredible that, you know, the, 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 the water courses and the air that we breathe don't recognize borders. And, and yet, you know, we're not working together in terms of, um, you know, joining up in our environmentalist uh, approach. Um, it's like, spatially, it's incredible that, like, a motorway was built from Belfast to Newry, and instead of going straight on to Dublin, it turned, it turned left to go to Warren Point. Do you, know, do you know what I mean? You know, just the, the logic, people were spatially not w working together. And you know, there was no benefit to, um, to that. So what we're saying very, very, very clearly is, while unity is obviously a difficult issue for many people still, each one of those blocks can be focused upon. And we can work on each one of those blocks separately, an All-Ireland Ambulance Service, an All-Ireland, you know, uh, you know, air, air ambulance. Um, I, I would even, you know, while there, while, while there are difficulties in lots of nationalist communities in terms of how policing is working at the moment, and there, we would have difficulties with regard to MI5's role in, in policing, we would like to see a day where, you know, the, 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 the PSNI can hot pursuit a criminal across the border and, or, and, and the Gardaí can hot pursuit a criminal north of the border. The idea that the, the, the border could be a competitive advantage for a criminal is incredible that you know they could rob a, a, an ATM machine in Cart Macross, hightail it to the border, and then wave at the uh, the, the, the the pursuit uh, who's following them. So if we look at each one of those blocks and see how do we remedy the problems that they concern, to materially benefit the individuals looking on both sides, are living on both sides of the island of the island. In that scenario, we can improve people's lives first and foremost. But what it does do is that on that sunny day when there is unity the height of the border reduces by each block that's taken out. And the transition towards unity is far more simple with regards to that. Uh, and I, I honestly think that when people see the economic, social, societal benefits that accrue from those changes, the step will not be as big in relation to that. And you know, to be honest, we won't be able to convince everybody uh, in relation to this. But when the southern state was founded, everybody wasn't uh, convinced either. But I would challenge you to find anybody from a former unionist background in the south of Ireland to say that they do not support um, the, the, the state in the south of Ireland. OK, we're going to take one more question from online and then one more from the floor. So I'm going to take this lady just, I'll take one question online and then I'll take this lady next. So um, we're getting a, a lot of people online asking about the war in the Ukraine. Should Ireland join NATO and change its neutral stance? Uh, under no circumstance should Ireland uh, join NATO. Uh, the war in Ukraine is an absolute disaster. It's wrong. Uh, we oppose, obviously, um, the, the Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine. Um, just you know, hearing the, the likes of Mariupol there, where there's 5,000 civilians have been killed, it is just heartbreaking. And actually, our offices um, in different parts of the country are collecting materials to send them over to the Ukraine. And today. Thankfully, I was at a, a truck that's traveling to Poland. It was organized by a Polish priest who's living in County Mead at the moment, gathered materials, uh, and is now on the way to Poland in relation to that. Ireland has a long, proud history of uh, neutrality. Now, military neutrality is not the same as political neutrality. You, you can stand uh, with a strong view in relation to what's wrong and what's right. And also, you, know, you don't have to be inactive. You can use peaceful, humanitarian, uh, activities to make sure that you save lives. So, like, they need blood, they need oxygen, they need medicines in the hospitals, they need foods, they need uh, clothing, they need, you know, uh, there's, they need money in relation to the humanitarian response to this. And Ireland hasn't exhausted our humanitarian response whatsoever. But if we align ourselves to a military bloc, I think it, it will cause grave dangers. First of all, because of our past, because of our, uh, our you know, peacekeeping activities, because of the fact that we were very involved in anti-colonialism across the world, because of the missionary work that Irish people have done right through the developing world, Irish people are respected. You know, people will tell you when they travel on an Irish passport, you know, it opens doors uh, and opens minds in relation to uh, our travel. We would squander 
that com competitive advantage, that key uh, uh, capacity to be a, an actor of good faith uh, in relation to uh, you know, de-escalation and peace development if we got involved in a military bloc. And the second thing I would say is military blocs often are active on the basis of their economic interests. Iraq, you know, uh, uh, Syria, the, the, Libya, the world unfortunately is littered with hundreds of thousands uh, of, of dead uh, people as a result of military blocs for economic reasons going into uh, war in certain areas. Small countries can't influence those military blocs. So our young men and women will be sent abroad in terms of, of those wars we won't have the influence to dictate in relation to what those wars are. Um, an actual fact, we, sh we need to do far more work. I would like to see the government involved with what I called active neutrality. You know, how come the Israeli Prime Minister can ring up Putin and at least do his best to try and de-escalate the situation? Or Macron can ring up, or, you know, unfortunately the southern government has outsourced a lot of its foreign affairs activity now to the European Union. Um, and the European Union is taking over that competence, and I think that's wrong. But we need, as a sovereign, independent state, you know, to exercise our sovereignty, especially when it comes to trying to support Ukrainian sovereignty. Okay, last question. Um, I know you touched on this uh, slightly, but I just wanted to kind of expand a bit on it. Looking from the side of the board, and I would classify myself as a Republican and I want to see United Ireland. Looking from the side of the, the border, it seems to me that Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael, um, and some associated parties don't have a real interest in promoting a United Ireland. And I'm wondering, why do you think that is? I mean, they're incredibly passive. And I also wonder, is an aspect of that in relation to, which kind of makes sense, that they look up north, especially recently with Coveney, and they think, we don't want to pull that down in our heads. So is it a realistic concern about what, what may happen if they're promoted? And, and do you think they're invested in United Ireland? I, I think there's, there's a couple of things there. Um, there, there I'm reminded of the John Bruton statement. That I don't know if, I, if I'm, I, I'm doing him justice, but to paraphrase him, he went to the north again and some expletive uh, after that. Uh, and I think the reason by, why was because many of the political southern parties um, are so just focused on the south that they don't really pay that much attention on the north of Ireland unless it becomes problematic, so to speak. Um, and, and I'll tell you the reason why. It's not because it's representative of the general population of the South. It's not. Many of the political parties in the North, or in the South, have become what I would call ideological husks. And what I mean by that is they don't have any core values anymore. So they have the clothing of their founding fathers and, 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 and founding mothers, uh, and they have some of the cultural, let's say, uh, trappings of where they came from. But if you really find out what makes them tick, I'll tell you what it is, is staying in power or political office. And that's why you know, I noticed when I, you know, over the years that the major tool that's used in the, in the South at the moment politically is the finger in the air. I've said it a heap of times in, in, in debates. They find out which way the wind is blowing. And whichever way the wind is blowing, they'll go that direction. And that's true a lot of the north of Ireland as well. Like many people will know of people you know, in, in the north of Ireland who flipped on core values such as the right to life. And they go, God, I can't believe they've gone that direction. Let me tell you, the wind blows the other direction. They'll flip just as quick back because they don't have a foundation or a root in their core values at, at the moment. Um, there is, I think, the core objective of many of the politicians on both sides of the border is keeping their seats. And keeping their seat means saying the right thing on the media and answering the questions so that they don't get any more hard questions back. There is a major absence, a vacuum, if you like, in the political establishments, north and south, of you know, conviction, of object objectives, of trying to achieve a certain type of Ireland. You know, it's, it's, you know, most political parties now in, 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 in the north and the south don't have a membership base and they don't have commons that are functioning. Um, and they're not listening from the grassroots 
what's happening in communities. What they're using is focus groups and opinion polls. And I hear them, you'll hear the establishment in the South talk about citizens' assemblies, and they laud the citizens' assemblies. The citizens' assembly is just a fancy focus group. You know, it's just taking 100 people in and asking them questions and, and feeding them a certain diet of information and, you know, getting an answer back and outsourcing the responsibility to have ideological and philosophical discussions about where we need to be as a country. And actually what we're looking to do in AIM2 is quite the opposite of that. We don't want to be a husk, we want a core. And what we're trying to do is actually build a membership grassroots organisation. And we want people who are active on the ground, who are meeting in commons, who are having philosophical and political and economic uh, discussions about where we need to be as a country. But for that to happen, we need people to take responsibility too. Because we cannot do it by ourselves. And one of the reasons why the establishment exists the way they do, I often get asked questions. How come Ireland has changed so radically in terms of the, rights to, the human rights to life and other issues? And the reason being is because they turn up to the meetings. You know, there's not a massive amount of these activists on that side of the debate that you know, have such a sea change of influence over the direction of the country. But they decided to become active, to, 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 decided to become strategic, decided to become cohesive, and to get involved in politics. And they have entered most of the political, pl political parties, and they're steering those political parties now. And if only we can get our side of the debate to take the same responsibility over what way the country is going. Um, so to answer your question, I don't believe necessarily that the, the political parties seemingly disinterest in the North is representative of the people of, uh, of the South of Ireland at all. I believe that if you scratch the surface, most people in the South of Ireland, you'll find a, a person who loves their country and wants to see it united, wants to see a peaceful, agreed Ireland developed with our brothers and sisters in the unionist community. And I actually believe that the diversity that unionism would bring to the country would make it stronger and a better country as well. But the reason why the political establishment of Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael don't want to do that is because they're just looking to keep the seats. And secondly, unity is actually a threat to the political power of Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael. Because they only function on one side of the border. If they were to become all Ireland political parties, such as ourselves, they would then see, um, there, obviously it would be a challenge to do it. It's not easy for a start. It would take a lot of effort. It would take a lot of energy uh, to do it. Um, but in a, in a United Ireland situation, instead of being a party of 25, maybe 30% of, 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 of the vote, they would fall to parties of 15% of the vote they would have less chance of getting into government, less chance of becoming ministers and influencing the direction. Liam Mellows was a, a TD for uh, Meath uh, at, uh, during the, 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 this, this, the War of Independence and the First Dole. And he said, if there is partition, they will grow on both sides of the border two establishments who will start to rely on the border for their own power. And that's exactly what's happened. OK, well... Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the public lecture for this evening. Um, we have two more lectures left in the series, one with Colm Eastwood and one with Naomi Long. We're just trying to confirm dates. So if you look at our social media accounts online, you'll find out when they're going to be and hopefully we'll get them in place either before or shortly after Easter. We've also a series of other hustings events coming up with uh, leaders right across the spectrum, linked to the business community and civic community and look out for them as well. But in terms of this evening, I'd like to thank Dr. Morris McCartney who put together this event. I'd also like to thank you and the audience for coming out this evening. Those online who tuned in and we've got plenty of questions and sorry about the, the technical difficulties at the start, this entire event will go out um, in its, its holistic form uh, later on this evening as part of the recordings. If you go to the public engagement website on the university site, you'll get them online. And finally, I'm delighted to thank our special guest this evening, Peter Tobin, who came up this evening to put forward his point of view on behalf of Into. And please show your appreciation again for our special guest. Thank you.